Today is Tuesday, August 3rd, and this is Tokyo Daily, the Olympic show from the Toronto Star. I'm your host, Brendan Dunlop. Upset city in the sand. It wasn't supposed to end like this. After celebrating two Canadian teams reaching the quarterfinals in women's beach volleyball on a path to meet each other in the semifinals, which would have seen Canada play for two medals in women's beach volleyball, both Canadian teams are out. Despite the heat, Sarah Pavin and Melissa Jimena Paredes, they were unstoppable in Tokyo. They had been unstoppable. The world number one pair hadn't even dropped a set until Tuesday, losing their quarterfinal match to the Australian duo of Clancy and Artacho del Solar in three sets. The Canadian pair just never found the rhythm under the lights. Unforced errors doomed the other Canadian pair of Brandy Wilkerson and Heather Bainsley. They fell in three sets to Latvia, ending their medal hopes after a very impressive win over the American favorites in the last 16 round. In their toughest test yet, the Dream Team finally looked like one. Team USA knocked off European giant Spain 95-81 despite a slow start. The Americans punched their ticket to the semifinals where they will face Patty Mills on Australia who throttled Argentina in the other quarterfinal. Kevin Durant, 29 points. 13 of those came in the game-changing third quarter for the Americans. He might just be the best Olympic basketball player ever, certainly adding to his case for it. Another player adding to his case for that title with every single game, Luka Doncic. 20 points on Germany, powering Slovenia to a quarterfinal win that pits the Olympic debutantes against unbeaten France in the other semifinal. Slovenia are 17-0 in competition with Luka Doncic. They're now looking to add Olympic gold to the European Championship that they won in 2017. Long way to go, but Slovenia, definitely a team to watch. USA's win also meant the end of an era for two of Europe's most successful basketball players. Dave Feshuk wrote a great piece on the star.com today about the Gasol brothers. Marc Gasol, of course, will forever be a legend in Toronto in the eyes of Raptors fans all across the world. I want to read a part of Dave's piece here on what Mark and Powell have meant to Spanish basketball. He said, to put in a bit of context, Canada hasn't qualified a men's team to the game since 2000. But in each of the five Olympics since, there's been a Gasol involved, and usually in a medal game. Winning one gold medal at the Olympics is pretty impressive. Winning two, just one hour apart, sounds made up, right? It's not. That's what New Zealander Lisa Carrington did on Tuesday. She won the single kayak 200 meter race and then jumped in the two paddler kayak to win the doubles 500 meter with teammate Caitlin Regal. And to make it even sweeter for the Kiwi, Carrington said record times in both. Speaking of records, Andre de Grasse set a personal best in the 200 meter semifinal, running a time of 1973 in what felt like 40 degree weather on Tuesday in Tokyo. Very happy to go back to Tokyo and speak with Bruce Arthur from the Toronto Star. Bruce, it's been 12 days since we last spoke. How are you feeling in Tokyo? One of my favorite games, the Olympics, is you ask people who are like general assignment people, what'd you do yesterday? Yep. And this is about the face they give you. They just kind of go, I don't know. Most <laughs> people do anyway. And every day is a lifetime here. It's the greatest thing in the world to cover. And it takes a lot. <laughs> Yes, it does. Well, you've put out some great work. I've read uh, all your columns on the Toronto Star um, on the star.com. It's been incredible. I look forward to the Simone Biles uh, column because that you were at the gymnastics to see her back on the beam today. Yeah, and it was really interesting because she didn't know if she was going to do this. Yeah. Um, the twisties, which I, I did not know because I'm not a gymnastics guy, is basically you're in the air and then your brain and your body don't talk. And a lot of people have written about it, but like with someone like Simone Biles and really with any elite gymnast, you could really hurt yourself, like anywhere from a broken leg or a sprained ankle to a broken neck. And it usually takes time to reset that. But the thing is the beam doesn't require twisting. And so she just simplified her dismount and was medically cleared after like she had panic attacks, she said this week. Um, she was really scared that, that she wasn't gonna be able to come back. And then, so she did it. And she finished third, two Chinese gymnasts finished first and second, they're masters of the beam. And Biles was thrilled. And the only sad thing apart, it, sad thing part, ah, uh, day 12, sad part about it for Canada is that Ellie Black was sitting third, despite the fact that she was competing with a sprained ankle that she had re-sprained a week ago. And she had to simplify her dismount too. And for both of them, there was something in common about this because Black didn't know if she could go either. Like it was just days ago she thought she could do this. Um, and for her, she's 25. 
Biles is 24. This could be their last Olympics. Black's done, this is their third Olympics. And it was really, gymnastics is a hard sport. It is a brutal sport beyond just the athleticism of it. Um, all the Larry Nasser stuff and everything like that. And that was tough for both of them. It was just, that was some tough stuff. And Ellie Black finishing fourth, that's the highest a Canadian woman's ever finished in a gymnastics event. And for Biles, I think that was one of the triumphs of her career. Absolutely. Talking about the twisties, I was speaking with a uh, former Canadian diver, Alex Depati, Olympic medalist, and talking about what that's like. As divers, you know, they experience it as well. And he said immediately, the difference is I'm not falling onto a mat. I'm falling into water. And he's experienced it and it's intense. You have no control. And for, you know, in a sport like that where they're so fine-tuned, they're almost always in control. The moment is scary. And in diving, he says, you just got to get back up there and see that it's gone and try and shake it off. And if it's in training, you know, you can do that. In competition, a totally different thing. But the difference between gymnastics and the, the risk that, you know, Simone Biles faced versus him on a three-meter board or on a 10-meter board, as he says, it takes a long time to, to, you know, potentially get over it and shake it off. So for her to make the adjustments that she needed to be on the beam, it was great to see her back out there. And as you say, yeah, to Ellie Black to be so close there um, contending, that must have made for a pretty, pretty incredible day at the gymnastics stadium. Yeah, like Ellie got off the bar and immediately, like uh, people cry at the Olympics. People cry win or lose. She cried hard because she honestly, like the the amount of emotional energy that athletes put into sports, I think is un, almost underrated. With the Olympics, it's stored up emotional energy, right? This is a five-year cycle. People had to rejig training programs. The pandemic was hard on everybody. It's just compressed us all in this fundamental way, I think, and not everyone really realizes it. Yeah. And so Simone Biles, her voice caught twice uh, in the probably 15 minutes she talked to the media. And one is just, she said, when I was cleared for the beam and it meant that much to her, there's that, like that nearly made her cry. And the other is that she said she was going to start taking care of herself and not sweep it under the rug. Like she's become the face of kind of mental health in sports at this Olympics because she's one of the biggest stars in the world and she pulled herself out of a competition in the middle of it because she just couldn't do it. Um, that was an interesting thing to hear her say. Um, and so that was a really interesting night. Like I don't cover a lot of gymnastics. I don't get to do it very often. It's a fascinating, hard, difficult sport. And I hope people appreciate that. I hope people appreciate it too. It is incredible to watch on TV. It's an amazing television sport, certainly. What's it like in the mix zone? Um, not just today at the gymnastics center, but obviously in this, this, these COVID Olympics, what have those mix zones been like? Uh, epidemiologically hilarious is how okay. I would put it. Um, like, so the funniest mix zone is a track. And most mix zones now, with, usually in a mix zone, it's a sea of humanity. You're separated by barricades between you and the athletes everyone's reaching over it's like the usain bolt uh mix zone at the 2016 olympics was like being you know the pictures you're seeing out of Lollapalooza. it was like that <laughs> um so what they're doing is they're giving tickets so you get a ticket to get into the mix zone and so there's a limited number of people in there but the thing is people still cluster because you kind of have to it's still crowd like you put, your, you put your recorders on a tray and someone holds it up next to the athlete because they're six feet away uh, a track so you're in and there's so this is what i was watching here's a fence and here's a bunch of Chinese media because they're talking to the sprinter. And there's probably 15 Chinese media in there. And here's another fence, which is the other end of the mix zone. There's probably 40 Chinese media. They are outside the mix zone. They are clustered as closely together as the ones inside the mix zone, which by the way is an outdoor mix zone in terms of ventilation. It's COVID is not conducive to the Olympics. The fact that there have been so few positive tests in the bubble is honestly surprising. I, I've been I really didn't think that was going to happen. I guess fewer people have broken the rules than they than could have. But we are also weren't allowed on public transit for the first 14 days. There's been you're not supposed to go into restaurants, even though I think some people have. Um, so it's it's been a really weird Olympics, um, just a really strange one. And at the beginning, I said I hope I'm happy to have done this, and I think that's probably still where I am. Did you expect to write a story like the one about Kristina Simonovskaya? the Belarusian uh, athlete who was, um, I don't even know what terminology you used to describe here, but removed from the Olympic Games. Uh, I, I was 
teetering on using the word kidnapping because that's certainly how it uh, was described um, by herself and, and by some others. But uh, did you expect to be able to, to do that story? Uh, that was an interesting one. That was basically the, a defection. Um, Belarus is basically a rogue state. They've had the same uh, president since 1994. He crushed democratic positive protests there last year, which included a lot of athletes who went to prison. So Lukashenko and his son, Lukashenko is the, is, is Alexander Lukashenko is in charge and his son is in charge of the National Olympic Committee. They were both banned from these Olympics. What happened with her is she didn't even criticize the regime. She criticized the coaches, but the coaches were worried that the entire, there's a great recording. I put a link in the piece. Um, there's a great recording that was translated where they basically said, they're going to purge the whole track team. We got to take you home. And she didn't think she would be safe. This is what happens when you do business with autocracies. And the problem with the Olympics pretending that it's a transnational force for world peace is that you got to invite a lot of people who don't play by the same rules. And the fascinating part of that is that the next Olympics is going to be in China. Now, there's rumors already that there's going to be a three week hard quarantine before you can go, um, that which will dissuade most foreign media from going, which I think for the Chinese is, government is probably a feature, not a bug. Um, but the extreme sensitivity of the Chinese regime to anything re resembling criticism in any way. Daryl Morey, the gen the, then the general manager of the Houston Rockets, tweeted free Hong Kong, and it cost the NBA hundreds of millions of dollars because yeah. of the Chinese reaction. Um, athletes are basically being told, don't talk about anything involving these topics in China, like Uyghur Muslims, Hong Kong. Taiwan at the Olympics competes as Chinese Taipei under a different flag than the ta Taiwanese flag because of China. It's going to be an incredibly illiberal Olympics. It's going to be the end of kind of the, the really terrible cycle for the IOC where they had the, the absolute corruption of Sochi that Rio nearly fell apart. Pyeongchang was good. This one's a pandemic. Next one's Beijing. And then they get to play around in Europe and North America for a while uh, before hitting Australia. But the, it's complicated being the Olympics. It's complicated doing this. It doesn't help that these guys are generally immoral and I don't think cared very much about protecting her or indeed any athlete at all. Yeah, very well said, very well said. I also cannot believe that Beijing is just five months away. Um, you know, basically for, for anyone in this Olympic cycle, anyone working this Olympic circle, uh, it's, it's not much time off before you're, you're right into it and, and doing the Winter Olympics. Uh, let's finish up on Andre de Grasse, who will run in the 200 meter final. Um, what have you thought of him so far? And you're going to be at the, at the track, um, at the Olympic stadium tonight, tomorrow night. Well, remind me to remind me, I forgot to say, we should talk about a quick one about women's soccer too, because I was there. Sure. Got yeah. Get it in. That please. was my yesterday, actually, if you'd asked me, you asked me before what we should talk about. And I forgot that yesterday I covered a defining women's soccer match. Yes. Andre de Grasse is a burner. He's not a great starter, um, but when he gets up to his top speed, he's elite. Um, he might lose that final, but I have almost no doubt he's going to be on the podium and he could very well be gold. Um, Andre used to drive his coaches crazy because he didn't take heats or even semis as seriously as he should. Running in 1973, a 1973 uh, personal best in the semis, that's how you're supposed to do it. Like you lay down a number and like he could lose to the two American kids. Uh, absolutely. Um, we'll see what Aaron Brown can do. That's going to be interesting. But there's a lot of people in the track world who think that Andre DeGrasse is the favorite going into the 200 tomorrow night. That's for women's soccer. Um, that was one of the most fascinating things I've ever seen because Christine Sinclair, like the kids who were on that team, Laura Armstrong had a great point about this. Most of the kids on that team were between eight, 11 and 18 when London happened. Uh, really Manchester, but London. Uh, the 4-3 game, Christine Sinclair's hat trick, Norwegian referee, all of that, the greatest soccer match ever played. And that soccer match has been echoing now for nine years. And it echoed in that stadium. And it was incredible because when the Americans made their biggest push was when Megan Rapino and uh, Carly Lloyd and like the Christian press and like the old guard was put back in the soul of that team, like Megan Rapino scored twice in, in the London game. People forget that. Um, and Canada held them off. And it was the defining victory for Canadian women's soccer. They hadn't beaten the United States in 20 years, a game in which Christine Sinclair, I think at 18, she might've been 18 years old, scored. Um, like, and uh, so many of the players talked about how they did it for her, right? They did it for the people who were on that team before. And the sheer emotion there, because it was probably the end of the US's golden generation, which has won two World Cups and an Olympics. 
Um, I'm not sure Rapino's going to be back. I don't that Carly Lloyd's, you could tell she wasn't coming back. That was an indelible sporting moment. And now Canada gets to fight against our ancient enemies, the Swedes, um, and play them Friday in what's going to be a really hot, really difficult soccer match. And I don't know if Canada's going to win or not, but Christine Sinclair is going to play for Olympic gold. And it's going to be really impressive. It's, it's incredible. I'm glad you brought it up. I'm really glad that you were there as well. I was speaking with Diana Matheson and Karina LeBlanc yesterday, and they were you know, so emotional in, in seeing what these women had done, uh, what these players had done, and uh, having been, you know, been a part of that. And they, they both humbly said themselves, look, we just started the conversation and got more eyes on it. Uh, we wanted to leave the game, Diana Matheson said, we wanted to leave the game better than we found it. And what these players have done is incredible, and they've taken Canadian soccer to new heights. And yeah, I think that the push and the support you know, of, of the whole country and wanting to see Christine Sinclair have a gold medal around her neck is going to make uh, the final pretty special. Will you be there for the final on Friday? Be damn right I will be. Amazing. Okay, I look forward to it. Perhaps we'll speak yeah. after that. Thanks very much for this, Bruce. You bet, Brennan. The men's 200-meter final will run at 8.55 a.m. tomorrow. So that's 8.55 a.m. on Wednesday. Make sure you wake up for it. You won't want to miss it. You can catch all the track and field action tonight, then wake up for the big race tomorrow. Everything available in Canada on CBC and everything available across all their streaming platforms as well. Check out Rosie DeMano's piece in the Toronto Star today about transgender Olympic weightlifter Laurel Hubbard and Laura Armstrong's latest about Canadian uh, national soccer team star Quinn, who became the first openly transgender and non-binary athlete guaranteed to win an Olympic medal with Canada's semifinal win over the United States yesterday that Bruce and I talked about. Thanks for listening to Tokyo Daily each and every day. Remember, you can watch the show on YouTube throughout the Olympic Games. I'm Brendan Dunlop. I'll talk to you tomorrow.